Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of History Now the Future, the show where we take a sharp look at some of the most pressing issues of today using history as our guide and the future as our destination. My name is Corey Bradford and today our guest is a very interesting guest indeed. He is an author and the former editor for Crack.com. He used to write books under the name David Wong, uh, but now he just goes as himself. He's written about eight novels. His eighth novel is about to come out soon, and that's going to be the main thing we talk about today. However, he has also, much like myself, become extremely famous on social media for his TikTok videos, and I'm very interested in talking to him about that phenomenon as well. Uh, please welcome to the show, Jason Pargin. Thank you so much for joining us. Is it Jason Pargin? Do you like Jason Pargin or Jason K. Pargin? Uh, I only added the K because I think when I tried to get the domain name, somebody had stolen Jason Pargin. Uh, but I don't know. Some authors throw that middle initial in there and it seems fancier. Yeah. And I don't know. And you have some fantasy authors have come up with another middle name somehow. So I don't know if I could throw like a Jason K.R. Pargin. That's pretty cool, right? But I know yeah. I've never gone by that in my life, but... I don't know. Does it make me seem like a more serious writer if I use that middle initial? Well, you know, about a few, several years ago, when I decided to try to become a quasi entertainer, I originally went by Corey A. Bradford. And it was for one of the same reasons. There was a basketball player named Corey Bradford, and I didn't want us to get uh, confused. Uh, but the ages sounded kind of pretentious and it just didn't work. So eventually I, I just I just dropped it. And then I figured, hey, he has the E in his Corey. I don't have the E. So I figure people will be able to make the distinction. Also, I'm not like six foot anything, so I don't think people will mistake me for a, a basketball player. The actor Michael J. Fox had to add the J because under actor union rules, there was already a Michael Fox out there, someone who we obviously have never heard never of. Never heard of. It didn't matter. He got, he got to it first. And you can't use the whole middle name because then you're a mass murderer <laughs> or you've, you've, you're an assassin of some kind, right? Because that's that's what they do when, they, yeah, when you've John committed some sort of a horrific Brooks crime Booth. suddenly. Lee yeah. Harvey Oswald. Yeah, no, you're right. I was, I'm was, i sorry. I was just going through my head of all the mass assassinations and they all have the middle name included. Yeah, you're absolutely right. I didn't I didn't think about that. Yeah, Michael B. Jordan had to do that as well. So people wouldn't mistake him for just like myself for a basketball player. Um, Jason, I, I love the way your brain works. I just want to start by saying that because the first way, the first manner in which I was introduced to you was on TikTok. Uh, it was about two years ago. And I think you were pretty fresh on TikTok at this time. I saw a video you made about the way creative people's brains work. And you were giving advice to people who were managing like writers or creative people. And you were telling them like, you know, sometimes it's gonna look like these people aren't working at all. And really that's just a part of the creative process. At the time I was working at a startup media company in New York. Uh, I had a really strict boss and I wish I could have showed him that video. In fact, I think I tried to show him that video because it was like a lot of times I, I work in a very chaotic manner. I was doing writing for them and hosting for them. And I was just going back and forth between my phone and the internet and the computer and everything, trying to like get my thoughts together. And a lot of times he would come out of his office and look at me. He's like, this jerk off scrolling on TikTok again. Like he's not working. And like he didn't understand the way creative people's minds work. Is that something that you sort of discovered when you were working at Cracked? I have tried to keep it in mind when managing creative people because I am being my own boss has been awful because I am a terrible boss and I am very hard on myself. For example, I'm now these days I'm full time, you know, writing novels when I'm not doing TikTok and you know, you're measuring your progress by word count because what else is there? So when I have a day or week or a month where not any words are added, because what I was doing was working through some things in my mind, like you've got, you run into a knot in a plot or a section of the book that you just realize is boring and you're trying to work it out. That process does not often occur at the keyboard. It often occurs while you're just walking around. It occurs when you're laying in bed. It occurs when you're in the shower. What I have found over time is that it occurs when you've given yourself silence, where there's not constant input coming in. You're not constantly reading stuff or scrolling stuff or watching stuff. When you actually give your brain a moment to digest ideas, that's when the subconscious creative part of your brain suddenly springs a solution on you out of the blue because you've given it a chance to work. But I'm very hard on myself because if a week goes by, 
the work that I did in the background, I don't count it as work. And I should. It's like, no, you didn't get any words on the page, but you worked out that plot hole. You worked out that knot in the plot where you need something from this character, but you killed this character three chapters ago. So how are we going to do this? And the domino effect of making one change in the story requires you to change everything before and after. It's like, no, you were, you untied that knot. That's an accomplishment, but it's hard to quantify that because it's not like having a job where you're actually producing something. If you're baking cupcakes, you can count how many cupcakes you've made and sold, but doing anything creative and, you know, to try to explain to a manager, or if you're like myself and are very hard on yourself trying to explain, well, yeah, but I figured out what color this thing should be in this logo I'm designing. And it took me a week to figure that out to a boss. It's impossible for them to know if you are in fact just jerking around that whole week. So that's the thing. It tried to be kinder to myself. And then I was trying to be therefore kinder to the people working under me because at Cracked, I managed an army of freelancers. We're talking hundreds of them. And it is fascinating to watch how different people work. Some people cannot get up the motivation and energy to really finish a project until it gets close to deadline. Whether yeah. you give them a week to do it, a day to do it, or a month to do it, it doesn't matter six hours before deadline is when their brain kicks in and nothing changes it. You could hire a sniper to threaten to shoot them with like a red laser on their skull. Like they will shoot you unless you start the project. It doesn't matter. Their brain won't start producing ideas until six hours before the deadline. And you eventually just figure out that some people work that way. And yeah. uh, it's not because they're lazy necessarily. I mean, lazy people exist. It's just that sure. you have to, you have to be aware different people have different brains and every brain works differently. Yeah. Well, two things. Number one, I I came to that conclusion that you're right. The boss can't really determine whether or not they're engaged in their creative process or they're just screwing around. And so I I, I, I had to think like that as well to give you know my boss a little bit of grace. But also, too, I am that person that does not, that waits till five, six hours before that something is due to start working on it. Procrastination should be my middle name. I should be Corey P. Bradford, I, I suppose. Um, but... Um, you know, it's weird. You, you've been an author since I think 2007 was when you published your first book. Is that correct? There's actually an interesting story behind that because the mm -hmm. first book was written online for free starting in the year 2000. Oh, wow. And so I was just posting that to a blog that I had at the time when I had a few hundred readers and then John dies at the end. It was a, an accumulation of all these bits I had posted over like five years. Okay. So I got my first publishing deal and started to earn money with an actual book that was released in, you know, in physical form in 2007. And that's mm -hmm. the same year I got hired at crack, but I had been writing online for almost a decade prior to that and making almost no money because there just wasn't much money in blogging back then. And that kind of served as my writing school. So it, it's important to point out because people talk about how well, your very first book became a best-selling series. Your very first book got turned into a film that became a cult favorite. It's like you did that on your first time out. It's like, that's true. But what you're calling my first book was a five-year-long process of uploading chapters one at a time, seeing feedback and tweaking and going back and editing and changing stuff and learning. And so I kind of went to like a five year long fiction writing school. Mm -hmm. And I, I try to make that clear to people because a lot of people get very discouraged when their first book doesn't set the world on fire or it doesn't turn out as good as they wanted it to. It's like John dies at the end did not just pop out of my head. I know there's authors out there who have a backstory where like age 22, they wrote something amazing that did not happen for me. I started writing this thing in my mid twenties and the first stuff I wrote, I'm sure was amusing to some people, but in terms of learning how to do plot and character and everything, I, I had to grind it out. And then, yeah, at the end of five years, I had something that was pretty good, but before it became a printed book, I went back and edited it to death. The, the book, that book that made me famous or as famous as I, as I am, Every sentence in that thing has been rewritten five times, at least. It's I've I just worked and worked and worked. So, anytime somebody talks about the writing process as being this mystical thing, where I went to the desert and I did shrooms, and I just started writing and writing stream of consciousness, and this is what came out, and it's perfect. It's like, 
that's not me. Uh, I had to edit this thing to death. I had to craft every sentence because, uh, so yeah. So in theory, I have been writing fiction for the past 24 years. And what's so interesting about it, well, first of all, thank you for saying that because as an aspiring writer myself, it does get very frustrating when you're working on something and you just feel like it's not coming together and you do feel like there's this, you know, proverbial deadline that we're all sort of operating against, uh, whether it's just a deadline of life itself and you get to a certain age, you're like, well, I haven't done this. I haven't done that. So it is important to tell other writers that, Hey, you know, it, this is going to take time. This is going to take a lot of editing and rewriting until it gets anywhere close to being good. And so I appreciate that. But, you know, you did write, you know, you, you talked about the process of, of doing John dies at the end and, and taking this sort of five year step by step process of putting it out in pieces, tweaking it. It becomes a novel in 2007. It does get adapted into a film. I mean, I was actually in film school in 2012. And that movie was one of those like cult movies that people would talk about and you would hear about. And it was like, OK, let's go see this because it's something different. It's something a little a little odd. And so you became, you know, like you said, semi famous off of that. But in the last two years, your social media presence via TikTok, I mean, do you feel like that has given you even more fame than the, the last like decade and a half of writing novels? Uh, so I didn't do this by choice. I reached a place where in uh, around summer 2022, I was on Twitter. Twitter was dying. I had something like 50,000 followers there. I was on Facebook. Facebook was becoming... Uh, not great, a place where it kind of like the young people had seemed to have, to have abandoned the platform and it was getting really messy in terms of the just the junk that was getting spread around. There's a lot of politics and stuff. Yeah. So I was kind of losing my ability to keep in contact with people. I This was not a situation where every book I release sells more than the one before. I was yeah. could watch my followers go down. I could watch my ability to contact people. And everybody kept coming to me and saying, the kids are on TikTok. The readers are on TikTok. They're, they call it book talk. There's yeah. all these book reviewers and you can go to the bookstore and I would see the shelf they had set up book talk recommendations. And it's mostly romance and fantasy, things like that. But it's like, no, you've got to get on TikTok and you have to understand, I never did video in my entire life prior to 2022. I, in my, wow. all the way up through my mid, my mid forties, I did not do, I would I rarely like once a year would appear on like YouTube and answer fan questions. And it'd just be mm -hmm. me sitting there very awkwardly. I never wanted my face out there. I wrote anonymously for the first most of a decade of yeah. my life because I wanted the work to get famous. Yeah. I did not want me and my face and my voice to get famous. I do not want people to recognize me in public, which now happens with some frequency, but because any anything that I say like that, if that sounds like false modesty, like I'm out there, you know, promoting, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm waving to people from a parade, saying, "Oh no, don't look at me, I'm shy." For the first 47 years of my life, I worked really hard to keep my face out of it. I didn't, you know, start doing podcasts until like I don't know 2013, something like that, and even then, very self conscious, hated the sound of my own voice, but was told, hey, TikTok's where it's at. And I thought TikTok was all like 14-year-old girls just lip-syncing to yeah. songs and dancing to them. And it's like, I can't, a guy, a 47-year-old man should not be watching that. I'm like, no, 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 no. It's Hank Green is on there, the, yeah. the other Greens, John Green, Tom Green, all the Greens, they're all on there. And they're doing like smart, like science stuff. They, they like having an older guy, you know, explaining things. So I tried it spent a solid six weeks just browsing TikTok, just watching it, trying to get a sense of how the algorithm worked and what the format was and trying to figure out how to use the app and just started uploading around four videos a day at wow. the start, just pumping out ideas and just diff trying different links, different formats, different filters, different everything to see how it worked and just try to accumulate data on what people wanted to watch and what made for a good video and taught myself how to do that. So now I have 550,000 followers. The videos have been viewed more than half a billion times, billion with a B. Yeah. Uh, so far, far, far more people have seen me on TikTok than everything else I've done in my life combined. All my books, all my articles that cracked, 
all my podcasts, add it all up. It does not touch that half a billion views seen on TikTok. So to the world, I think I am now a TikTok creator who also happens to write books. And I do not doubt there are people on TikTok who now see me promoting the book that's coming out on the 24th and think, okay, this is the guy who cashed in on his TikTok fame. (laughs) He got a bunch of followers. He went to a publisher and said, hey, you know, I got a bunch of followers on TikTok. Let me write some. I got got this dumb idea. It's like, no, no. I am a washed up author who got on TikTok because I was was losing touch with the readers and the fans and I'm trying to reconnect. I'm someone who was very, a, a big shot in 2009 and 2010 and I'm trying to make a comeback and TikTok is, uh, that people consistently are shocked whenever I post about the book. There'll be tons of comments like, I didn't know you wrote books. <laughs> I followed you because you did that funny video about the lizard had like a leaf on its head. But I, I didn't. And you made like a joke about how I had it like the lizard looked like he was wearing a hat. That's the only reason I'm here. So it's weird because now there's all these people like, well, yeah, but your video, your your short form video guy, can you also write? It's like. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was 47 years old before I looked at TikTok for the first time. It's it, so no, trust me. I'm from, I'm here from another world. Well, I mean, your videos are so good. They're so incredibly good. The, the perspective that you bring to things, your analyses, the way you break things down. Like I said, it, it's something that I've been, I've been literally watching it. I think since you started doing it in 2022, I mean, like I, cause I was earlier today, I was, I was going back. I was like, when did I first see that video from him about the, the, the way writers work? And it was like September of 2022. Yeah, that was one of my first videos. Yeah. yeah it, yes. That was probably three weeks after I started it. So um, you're like, that was all, I will give you an example. Mm-hmm. I did that video. After I had been, because again, when you start doing stuff on camera, the first thing you want to do is you want to dress up and you want to try to like, oh my gosh, I got to comb my hair and I've got to look right. I did that video spontaneously. I had been on the treadmill and I was really sweaty and and an idea had occurred to me on the treadmill and it it occurred to me, it's like, you know, yeah, this was, this does not look like work, but I just did important work. So I just sat down and turned the camera and my shirt is like wet from being sweaty (laughs) and the video took off and realized Oh, this is part of what people like on TikTok. <laughs> that that there are channels where they are dressing up and they're looking pretty. But the idea that this was coming from a guy and like mm-hmm. my hair's all messy and, and yeah. it's like this is just a sweaty guy telling me this in his bedroom <laughs> and it's real and it's authentic because this is not coming from a guru. This is not coming yeah. from somebody who's trying to, you know, look how beautiful and handsome and, and articulate him. It's just a guy, a sweaty guy telling you this, and it's clearly true what you're hearing that that was a revelation to me that was one of my first really big hits i think that was one of the first ones that went over like a million views and it occurred to me that that's interesting that you are used to hearing from like polished people Mm -hmm. and i guess this is what people like about joe rogan that he is just a guy in a t-shirt smoking weed and for some reason in this world that gives him more credibility not less yeah, it's a sort of every man kind of persona that that he takes on, and then, yeah, I, I mean that's the unspoken rule of TikTok. I learned that very early on. I I got on TikTok in 2019 be- before the pandemic, and I did it because I was actually experimenting in stand up at the time, and I and then people were telling me, well, you know, you can do skits on this TikTok app, and same as you, I'm thinking that's for teenagers, that's for for people who dance and twerk and stuff. I don't do any of that, and they were like, no, 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 you this you do skits and you just do them by yourself. You don't need anybody else. You could just you play two different characters. And I was like, really, that seems absurd. And so I got on there and started seeing that. And I was like, well, really, I could just do skits on here and write it all myself, and it just out of nowhere blew up. And and it's and it's one of those things where I compare it to. In your book, which we're going to talk about extensively, I'm starting to worry about this black box of doom. Uh, by the way, that book really stressed me out, but I like it. It's, it's an incredible book. I, I, I want to talk so much about that, but uh, it kept me up a little bit at, at night after I, I got done reading it. But um, in it, the character Abbott has a, has a Twitch following and he can't like in person, he can't tell anybody, oh, yeah, I'm famous on Twitch or whatever, because he can't explain it to anyone who doesn't know what Twitch is or who is from outside that world. And that's kind of how my TikTok thing was for a long time. And my parents would be like, so what are you doing? And I'm like, I'm a professional TikToker. And they're like, what, what is that? What do you, why are you, are you, are you, what is that? And like, you know, my, my dad gets it now, uh, surprisingly, but, but, but very few other people in my life got it. And I couldn't, I didn't even like talking about it because I was like, I, I cannot explain to you, unless you're on there. 
I can't explain to you that this is very different from what you've heard and that I'm, I'm not dancing and I'm not lip syncing, at least not frequently. And I can't otherwise explain it to you. And so was that, did you feel like that maybe like when you started doing it, when you started blowing up on there, you have all these author friends, all these people, maybe from like different connections you've had over the last you know 20 years of writing. When, when you, when they asked you, you know, what are you doing? And you start saying, well, yeah, I'm working on this book, but also, yeah, I got this TikTok thing going on. Did you find it to be something that was difficult to explain to them or did they just understand it because of the times that we live in? It's funny because that goes back 25 years for me, because when I first started blogging on the internet, we're talking about 1998, wow. most of my family, most people did not yet have an internet connection in their home. Because it wasn't until the year 2000 that you saw most homes have an internet connection. So trying to explain what I'm writing on the internet, that was an era when people didn't know what that meant. Like, so can anybody do it or what, what is that? And then for the next several years, you know, the, I'm pouring an enormous amount of time into this. Because when I was writing John Dies at the end on the internet and posting it for free online, my day job, I was... I had a series of office jobs I'd gotten through a temp agency. I was not working in a creative field. I, I had no background in that whatsoever. I was doing data entry on insurance claims for, for a, a Medicare contractor. So um, trying to explain to people, well, I'm, I write columns on the internet or I write, I have a blog or I, I'm writing fiction on the internet. There's no context for, is that a prestigious thing? How much money are you making off of it? Any, like what, what is, why do you do it? Who's it for? It's because people had heard of the internet and they're like, yeah, you can go on there and like chat with people, right? Is that what you're doing? So this is not new for me being unable to explain that I have what seems like a dead end office job. I'm not in training to do something better. I seem to have no long-term career goals because there's not any advancement in what I'm doing other than supervising other people, you know, doing data entry on insurance claims, which is a decent job in terms of like my grand plans for my life to explain, well, I've got this writing thing going on the side and I'm hoping that someday I've heard, you know, that some bloggers have become millionaires because there was this dot com boom back in 2001 or so that I was like, well, maybe I can catch on to that. But there was no way to tell people that or explain what you were doing. So for most people, me getting this book put out in paperback and then having to explain, it's like, well, it's, it's, a, it's an indie publisher. They've got a few thousand copies out there. And then all of a sudden, like, oh, this is going to be a movie. And they've paid me. Like, they've paid me enough that I bought a car with the money. Then it became real. But that was 10 years into it. So from the point of view of so many people I talked to, that just came out of the blue. It's like, yeah. do you, so you write, you like write stories. When did this start? Like, this is what I've been doing on my evenings and weekends for the last eight, eight or nine years. It's just, when I tried to tell people that it doesn't, it's like somebody tells you they're a poet. It's yeah. like, well, okay. So what do you, is that a job you can have? What do you do? Do you publish it somewhere? So here, I'm so used to it that when I talk to people who I'm just acquaintances with, I usually don't tell them what I do for a living yeah. because it's hard. Or these days I can say, well, I'm an author. But usually when you tell people, if they don't know your work, you say you're an author, they assume that it means you're broke or <laughs> about to drink yourself to death. Because if you're not an author I've heard of, yeah. then you're just a sad wannabe like and it's like, no, there's a whole middle class of people that yeah. just make a middle class plumber's income writing books and they're not famous. You know, you don't see my books at, you know, Target or the grocery store. It's you see them at Barnes and Noble. Yeah. Uh, so the idea of being right there in the middle, it's always it's always been hard to explain to people what I do for a living. So this is not this is not uh, new for me. Uh, yeah. And it's just it's been, I can't remember the last time I was able to give like a normal answer to what, what do you do for a living? Yeah. Yeah. Well, it seems like you're used to it now. So this book, I'm starting to worry about this black box of doom. Uh, you said it's coming out on the 24th, September. Um, yes. This is your eighth novel. And you sent me in, in advance a copy of the book. I, I read it. Um, 
and I acquired a fair amount of existential dread from it, uh, which is not a bad thing. Uh, I, I I actually think that that everyone should read this book because you describe how social media is affecting this world, our psychology, how we interact with each other in the real world, how so much of this is spilling out into the real world. You describe it in a way that I haven't really seen it, you know, properly put in the proper context before. Like, if that makes any sense. Like, this is probably the best contemporary novel that I've read in quite some time. And I'm not just saying that because you're in front of me right now. Like, I, I truly, I truly do believe that. And this is as someone who, for the past five years or so, has been working and becoming quasi-famous, I guess, through social media. It actually made me question my own role in all of this uh, so much. So so for someone coming into it blind, because I have a lot of questions about this book and I don't want to give away any spoilers, but for someone coming into it blind, what is the best way you can kind of describe, um, just like, like log line it for me? What is one of the best ways you can kind of describe what this book is about? So first of all, this is a standalone novel. It's not part of the John Dies at the End series or any other series I've, I've written or anything else I've done. You don't have to. If you're hearing my name for the first time today, that's perfect. This book is a good place to start. The setup is that, and the, the hook that's on the back cover and everything, is that there's a young man who is driving for a rideshare service, and he meets a strange woman who offers him $200,000 in cash to drive her across the country. They're outside LA. She needs to get to Washington, DC, and she has with her a large black box, the box big enough that a person could be inside there in theory. And she says, I need this box. Me and this box need to be in Washington, DC in four days, but you cannot look in the box. You cannot ask me what's in the box. You have to leave behind any devices that can be tracked. No cell phone, no GPS, no laptop. We'll be navigating with a paper map. We'll be paying in cash. You cannot tell anyone where you're going. We leave now. Like you can maybe stop and get some clothes, but that's it. You cannot have time to think about it. We need to go and we need to go right now. This box needs to be in DC. He agrees to this, leaves his life behind, you know, takes off, doesn't tell anyone the internet gets wind of this trip because there are some seeds planted and some hints that this may be part of what they believe is a terror attack on the Capitol because of they find out where this box came from and start trying to theorize about what is in it. So you have a bunch of amateurs online and true crime enthusiasts and Redditors and people on Twitter trying to figure out where this vehicle is and how to stop it, and then theorizing about what is going to happen. So you have a ticking clock thriller where the suspense is, can these internet weirdos piece together the truth in time? Because as you watch the information percolate across platforms and you see how the platforms mutate the information, you start to realize, oh, we're all in big trouble. This is not a good way to try to solve a what you think is a crime in real time, which anybody listening to this who has tried to endlessly refresh Twitter in the midst of something like a mass shooting knows exactly what I'm talking about. Because theories run rampant. Trolls run rampant posting fake information because they think it's funny, posting fake videos of the shooter because they think it's funny. And trying to sort through that is a type of anxiety that I don't think existed prior to the last 30 years. Because once upon a time, when some sort of huge news story broke out, if JFK had been assassinated, everybody was glued to the same TV, watching the same news anchor, feed them information as it came in. They had one stream of information. So obviously there are advantages to the fact that we now have infinite information, but the ability to sift through it and find the truth and to resist all of the impulses you have that resist that. For example, the impulse to believe what you want to believe versus what we actually know gets in the way. 
and you can watch human nature fight against the flow of information like this thing that happens now every time there's a mass shooting and a bunch of right-wing grifters come out and claim the shooter was trans just because that's engagement and spreading hate is really good for engagement. That happens now every time. That is one of a thousand ways that the flow of information gets corrupted. So I was trying to write like a tense ticking clock thriller where this is what you're fighting against the ability to get the truth out in that ecosystem. And it's incredible because, <clears throat> excuse me, you get right into it. I mean, just immediately the thriller starts and you're automatically on this journey and you're and and, and my, in my mind the whole time, I don't, and it's, what's so interesting about it is you actually in the book, you simulate what it's like to be on social media during a time of crisis, even within the book, because I can't really tell what is in the box and who is telling the truth. Is the retired FBI agent telling the truth? Is, is you know, uh, green sunglasses girl telling the truth? Like, I'm, I'm trying to figure out who can I trust the most in this story? And it's like, you're trying to figure that out and while you see everybody in the story also going, going through that same phenomenon. And one of the main things, one of the main takeaways I got from this was that out of all the main characters, no one truly understood anyone else. Like when you hear the way the FBI agent describes Abbott, and then you look at how Abbott describes himself, there's a disconnect there. Like she's thinking of him of something that he totally is not. And, and that's the same for like every character, whether it's the, the, the father-son dynamic between Abbott and his father, whether it's the dynamic between Ether and Abbott, like the whole time everyone is thinking something about the other person that isn't, that isn't true or is slightly inaccurate or is based on some stereotype or one of their own personal biases. And, that and all of that is sort of clashing. And, and you do a really great job sort of just simulating how our preconceived notions and our biases sort of drive us towards thinking certain things in a crisis mode that may be as far from the truth as possible. And then also too, there are these little splashes of truth being thrown into that whole social media frenzy. And I, I think it's like incredible, like where, where like there's a splash of truth and then like a Redditor like will delete it because it doesn't go into their narrative of what they want this story to actually be. And that's just like, that is so accurate to what happens uh, in real time on social media. Like how much like social media research did you have to do? Or was it just like, Honestly, is it just like, you know, being exposed to all this in real time the way we all are, is that what just kind of guided you when you were writing this? I would love to go around and claim that I'm uh, like a cool dude who goes outside and does tons of stuff. And then to write this book, I had to research what it's like to be an extremely online nerd. And I had to like stop, I had to like park my jet ski to come get on Reddit and see <laughs> what is this Reddit thing? The truth is I've been on Reddit every single day since Dig collapsed and sent yeah. all of its user base to Reddit. Some people that all those words I just used, some people have no idea what I'm talking about or what Dig is. Other people are like, oh yeah, that day, the day that Dig went down and the great migration from Dig to Reddit. I've been terminally online since I got my first internet connection, my first AOL connection in, I think, 1997, 96, wow. around there. So going all the way back to the chat room, the IRC chat rooms, the Yahoo chat rooms, the and then the BBS and the, the forum era and, and all of that. And then when social media, I had a MySpace page when those first came around, I had a GeoCities page, you know, I had a WordPress blog, like every new thing that came along, I kind of got on there and tried it because I was so mesmerized by the idea of I can just type anything here and it just goes out to the world. Yeah. I couldn't believe it because I'm somebody who loved to read and I had gone to school for journalism before the internet existed because I graduated high school in 1993. So when my college years, you can do the math, not many people, the, the only people on the internet were like nerdy hacker types. Yeah. This was an era when you could go to whatever, Disney.com, and it was some guy's website because Disney was not on the internet yet. Like, and literally that happened. Like, they had to buy up all these domains from just some 14-year-old kid. It's like, oh, I own Disney now, huh? -huh. <laughs> so I have been in that ecosystem now for most of my life, but I had the advantage of being a 
technically an adult when I started. So I did not grow up in this ecosystem. So I was in theory, a fully formed human being getting on here in my post-college years and just taking to it and saying, okay, I will never be a traditionally published journalist or author because I don't have any me. I don't want to move to a big city. I don't have any connections to the publishing world, but I can just type anything here and it comes out. But if you're on there, you're also looking at your comment sections, you're looking at your feedback. And so just be participating in these discussions and arguing with people about Chicago area sports. That's how I spent the late nineties and then started, you know, I started my own blog and I think 99 around then had a bunch of different versions of it, but it had an, a message board attached. So this community of people whose faces I never saw for the most part, whose real names I never knew, that dynamic has fascinated me because from the first day you could see that people talk different online yeah. Yeah. because the weird thing that will happen when you will meet somebody who you've known on the internet for five years and you'll have a meetup or you will run into them and they are completely different. Yes. Where people who, you know, uh, posters who were pretending to be young women and they were middle-aged guys but the most common thing was that people who were hyper aggressive online and constantly just jumping out at jumping down your throat at the slightest perceived insult in real life were the most meek and mild mannered normal people. And so that revelation for me goes back a quarter century that when people are, are anonymous, and they know that they only have the text to convey their ideas, there's a tendency to go to extremes. Yeah. Because your tone of voice cannot be perceived. Yeah. They don't have any reason to care about your humanity because they can't see your face. They can't perceive you as a real person. So in order to get through, you have to exaggerate how angry you are. And this became a phenomenon, like all of the early internet creators or a lot of them, that was like their shtick. It, yeah. It's like, I'm the angry video game reviewer guy. And you can still see that on like early YouTubers. Oh, yeah. They're all like angry Joe or the, the bitter nerd channel. That's because there was this thing for some reason that in the medium, you ha you are angrier than you are in real life. And you're quicker to anger. To, to anger. And you, people would, when people would start arguing, instead of trying to come to a consensus, they would just keep taking more and more extremes, which is not a thing that necessarily happens in real life. If you've yeah. got a disagreement at work, you're usually trying to work toward something that works for both of you. Yeah. When people argue online and somebody says, uh, I think uh, the, the Dark Knight is Chris Nolan's best movie. And somebody else is like, nah, I thought it was just kind of boring. And I'm like, well, I think the dark Knight is the best movie of all time. Well, I think it's the worst movie. You could watch them like change their opinions to get further apart from one another. If you fast forward 25 years, that's now just standard yeah. for the way we talk about politics, way we, where there is just something about the medium. And this is something that I think future historians will study specifically the way in which the medium dictates the tone of the discussion like twitter the fact that you're limited to it used to be 140 characters they bumped it up to 280 there are there is no complex subject that can be argued 140 characters at a time in a way that's beneficial yeah it requires you so the the way people argue on twitter with the snide dismissiveness and the dunking that's where you'll just quote tweet and it's like you know, well, somebody will say there's 300,000 homeless in America and somebody will quote tweet on to dunk. I was like, uh, have we tried just giving them houses? <laughs> it's like, okay, this is a difficult subject, but Twitter wants you to boil it down to a snide insult where everybody's like Chandler on friends, where it's just a, a series of roasts. Now that you can see entire political campaigns that are run in that format where their only messaging is a series of one liner, uh, you know, snide dismissals of the other candidate, Twitter gave us that. Yep. That's fascinating. And we do not appreciate the corrupting influence of that, just the way it corrupts 
your ability to talk to one another. And it's crazy because the way you describe it, and this is something because I'm a little bit younger. And so my introduction to the internet was like early 2000s, mid 2000s. And I, I did have a MySpace. I had an early Facebook. But I don't remember it being quite as chaotic and quite as aggressive in that specific era. But, you know, you go back to this late 90s period that you're referring to. And it seems like there's always been this tendency to be a little bit more aggressive, uh, you know, exaggerate a little bit more, dig into your heels a little bit more when it comes to arguments. It seems like that was always there. And and maybe I just didn't see it as much because of the type of people I was interacting with when I was younger on the Internet. But certainly uh, social media post 2010, when we're talking about Twitter and Facebook and uh, and all of these different platforms, it has certainly become such an aggressive and argumentative place. And that is something that this book captures uh, very, very well. Um, one thing, one analogy that I that I thought of, would, and I don't know if this was purposeful, uh, purposeful, maybe it was, was when you talk about the black box of doom, and obviously in the book you describe it, uh, it's got, you know, multiple meanings to it, but you describe it sort of as this sort of, you know, empty chasm that, that social media has created for us. Um, to me, it really reminded me of like the Kubrick movie, uh, Dr. Strangelove. And I even see a similarity in the title because, you know, Dr. Strangelove's full title, I'm start, uh, How I Learned to Stop Worrying and Love the Bomb. It's almost like, you know, I'm starting to worry about this black box of doom. And then when you think about what people think is possibly inside this black box, am I, am I, is, is, am I, am I seeing something there or is that just me being crazy? Is that, was there some type of purposeful uh, analogy there to, to what this, what this internet is doing to us and how it could be comparable to something as disastrous as, you know, nuclear warfare? <laughs> Well, yeah, and I'm not going to compare myself to the to Stanley Kubrick, but the the absurdist, like you're in the midst of a disaster and everybody is behaving in a ridiculous way due to the posturing and what they think their role is and their different goals. And you've got all these people, you know, you've got a war room of people who none of them should be there. None of them are making good decisions. So there's... Yes, that that's an homage, but I don't I don't want people to think I'm comparing myself to to a, a master or anything. But it's the idea is that everybody is projecting what they think is in the box. And here's the thing: there is an answer. It, yeah, you know, th there is something in the box. And it's the same way when you know when they're trying to puzzle through the re you know the reality of a terrorist attack or a mass yeah. shooting on Twitter. There is a correct answer. It's not mm -hmm. like they've made it up out of the blue, but when people are trying to to gravitate toward an answer they're not just basing it on the available information they they have in many cases their own reputation they're trying to uphold so if they've decided that oh well these mass shootings are always a result of whatever and it's their so this is the group they demonize yeah. they have real motivation to for that to be the answer they're not just nobody is operating just as a robot where it's like give me the raw information, I'm going to process an answer. You're bringing all of your own baggage to it. So that becomes the thing that I think nobody could have predicted prior to the invention of the internet and social media, which is the way the brain tries to process all of this input because there's more than what you can process. So you have yeah. to pick and choose yeah. and you're trying to shape it into a narrative that makes sense for your life. And so if the narrative you're waking up with that morning is that, for example, America has lost its way with God and godlessness is causing all of this chaos and crime, then that's the lens through which you're going to try to see everything because that's your identity. That's how you make sense of the world. And I'm fascinated by the difference between elderly people, people my age, and how old are you? I'm 32. Okay. So you came up, if you're 32, so you were basically almost born into the internet, right? Pretty like much. when you were aware of the world, the internet was now Existed. an existing thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then the kids who only know a world of social media, yeah. mm -hmm. you know, the ones who are 10 or 12 years old now who they've, mm -hmm. you know, they've had a Facebook page, their parents made them one when they were infants. Mm -hmm. The difference between the elderly people who grew up before all of this 
and now cannot filter out disinformation worth a crap because they have no background and no context. And you see like all of the AI slop on Facebook oh my God. <laughs> versus people my age who were fully formed, like biologically fully formed adults before the internet came along. So we had to adjust to it, but we've been there from the start. Mm -hmm. And then the kids that are younger, none of us know how to talk to each other about the internet. Because I don't know how to talk to, like, if there's a 13-year-old girl and she's had to worry about how she looks on Instagram from the the day she was born, yeah. I don't know how to, to relate to that. Yeah. Because that wasn't me. I was allowed to grow up and make my mistakes and be a nerd out of the public eye. The idea of your awkward phase or your, if you're a teenage edgy jerk phase, that that's now preserved. There's an online preservation of that forever. I don't, I can't relate to that because I don't know what that's like. My, my teenage years are hidden. You, you know, none of you know what, a, what a horrible teenager I was. So I think culturally the technology moves so fast and now we're going to see it with AI where we don't know how to bring up our kids in this because the landscape is different from when we were that age. And it, I don't think we're even to the state, I don't think we're doing a great job of giving the younger kids tools for how to deal with all this stuff. Everything we're talking about that, you know, like the mental health burden and just misinformation and how to filter all of it. Because each of us had a very different experience with it when we were going through our, our formative years. And this next generation, it'll be different still because everything will be AI for them. Yeah, it's crazy because, you know, my, you know, the same, I would have the same problem, you know, communicating with that 13 year old girl because I, well, it's weird because my teenage years are in this weird way preserved online, but they're preserved on something called MySpace that isn't really a thing anymore and 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 it's kind of it's kind of a thing but it's not really a thing the way it was and so yes there is this digital graveyard of my teen years from myspace sitting somewhere but it's not as accessible as say someone who grew up in the tiktok age or the instagram age or or even like the later facebook age where it's like i can literally right now go see something they did like somebody who's like 23 I can go back and look at their, them at 13, like right now, pull up their most awkward moment of life, like right now. And it's like, how are people even going to like run for office at a certain point? I, I think, honestly, I think J.D. Vance, who is, who's the first, I think, millennial to be in his position, it, we're starting to see that effect of, you know, everything you've done ever online is going to somehow come back. And could be potentially used against you in the future when you decide you want to be a professional adult now. And so that's that's a phenomenon that I think my generation may be one of the first to kind of sort of deal with. But I think about 10 years younger, like five, 10 years younger, they're really going to have to deal with that. Uh, and it's and, and I think I don't know. Do you think that maybe minds will sort of adjust? It's like, OK, we were all there. We, it's kind of like, I guess, if you grew up in like the 70s, like, look, we were all we were all there with the disco ball. We all know what we did in, in Studio 54. So we can't really hold that against each other as much. So maybe when people grow up, they'll be like, OK, we were all there on Facebook. You know, will people have that sort of graciousness to say you were just young or will it just be a constant battle of using that against one, one a person? You know, I think humans are really good at adapting, but capitalism is even better at adapting. So it's funny because look, there was upheaval right after the printing press was invented. History oh, yeah. looked very different after suddenly you could distribute flyers, not just books, but you could crank out 50,000 flyers and, and get them out to people and say, Hey, you know, have you thought about how the King is doing this? And that's not right. And so you saw upheaval after that, you saw uphe upheaval after the invention of television. Yeah, I don't think that the hippie movement and the, the anti-war movement, I don't think any of that happens without TV. Yeah. So you're going to see different types of anxiety play out for the same reason, just because it's something new that people are not used to. You would like to think, well, yeah, you'll adjust. There'll be like a mutually assured destruction. We all accept that we looked weird when we were 14. We all accept that we had terrible opinions when we were 20, because that's what your 20s are for. If you're not some sort of an extremist weirdo in college, then I think you've missed out on the human experience. It's, I don't care if you were a communist in college or if you were, there's lots of people that I know who were edgy, libertarian, racist 
South Park types in college where they just made tons of that type of joke that now are totally normal people. Yeah. That's what college is for. That you, you get it out of your system. You, you're on your own for the first time. It's like, well, I can, I can say whatever I want. Nobody mm -hmm. can stop me. You do it. And then after a while, you're like, oh, okay, here's why they told me not to say things like that. I get it now. There has to be a place where it's like, we've all got an, an, an embarrassing past. And in fact, in theory, if you have always had the exact same opinion since the time you were six years old, that's kind of weird. That's really weird. Like if you, <laughs> if you came out of the womb woke, is it even a credit to me? Cause all that tells me <laughs> is that your parents trained you to be like progressive. That's nice, but you never ventured out on your own. I would respect somebody more. There was a dirtbag for a while, saw the error of being of their ways and said, no, I'm making the decision to not be a dirtbag anymore. To me, that means more than somebody that's just lived a very sheltered life and has never, has never strayed. So I would like to think that culturally we'll know how to handle that and that we will all agree, look, everybody's got a past that can be dug up, but People like to remember you in the era of your life where they felt the most superior to you yeah. and when they, or when they had the most control over you, they, they, if you've ever known some people who knew you were near a kid and they love to remind you of like, ah, I remember when you were a little kid and you pooped your pants at the, <laughs> at, at the hockey game, whatever. And it's like, they like to yeah. keep bringing you back down to that era mm -hmm. when they remembered you as an embarrassing child, the internet as long as there is like engagement to be had and profit to be made and ad ad revenue to be to be, to be made by holding up people's embarrassing past and then like tearing them apart over it and just picking a new person every day i suspect that's always going to be there because ultimately the platforms have to make money and what they figured out is that the thing that makes the most money is when people are at each other's throats. Yeah. That is the difficult part. That is the thing that as a culture, we have to adjust to or else we're not going to make it. No, oh, we're not going to make it at all. Uh, I, I, I've just, I, I kind of already come to that conclusion. But one thing you said that was very interesting is, you know, college is a time for mistakes. And you're 100% correct, except it seems like today, we don't we don't give people in college that sort of that sort of grace. We don't extend that sort of period to them where they can make those mistakes because you know it 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 feels like one of the problems on college campuses right now is that there is this sort of hive mind that you have to adhere to, and if you don't adhere to it, then you're all kinds of things that in an i s t or some phobic or something like that, and you know I get it as someone who. I tend to think of myself as a somewhat progressive person. I understand what these people are trying to go for. They're trying to uh, make this place more equitable. They're trying to make everything more accountable and, and, and get rid of all these, you know, bad, you know, discriminatory things that people have to deal with. But I think in their wanting to do that, they've gone down this weird rabbit hole where it's like, okay, we have this sort of litmus test. We have this sort of bar you have to meet when it comes to every single topic. And if you have like a 1% disagreement with any of these things, and it's like, who decided that we were all gonna think like this? Who decided that this was the proper way to think about this and that there's no other way to think about it? And so, yes, you're right. College is that time period for you to experiment with different ideologies, for you to experiment with different things. And yes, you are gonna fall into some pitfalls of things that may not be that, that great, you know, ideas that may be a little bit harmful at times. But you grow out of it, you turn into an adult, and eventually you level out. And I think we're going to have a problem. And I think that's honestly one of the things that we're seeing now. We're seeing a lot of adults, maybe my age, around my age, who aren't leveling out. Because when they were in college of the last like five, 10 years or so, they were told so much that you're wrong about this and you're wrong about that and you can't do this and you can't, can't say that. So now it's like almost like, you know what, I'm going to just be like this for spite. You know, it's kind of like when Jerry tries to return the shirt on Seinfeld. It's like, I'm just doing this for spite at this point. Like, there's no other reason for it. And they, they've kind of gotten almost um, pinned into a corner. And I, and I kind of, again, going back to your book, I feel like that happens a lot with some of these characters in this book where they have a moment where they can do something different, where they can take another choice. Uh, the, the Phil Green character is a good example of this, where they could take another choice, but then something happens 
and it sort of pins them in this corner and their response is, okay, I'm going to double down. I'm going to go even further into this, into this path. Uh, I mean, do you feel like that's going to just become an even more problematic trend because we aren't allowing young people to have that freedom to make mistakes? Ben, I think all of this is just a reaction because everyone wishes they could control the flow of information. And it is a totally normal and human impulse. You know, and the thing about if you say, well, I think that, you know, the social media platforms should be doing more to stop misinformation. That is the most sensible thing in the world to say, because if you spent five seconds on Facebook and seeing the memes that go around among older people and, and whatever scaremongering about immigra- immigrants or whatever they've got, you it is easy to say somebody should be controlling this. The actual mechanism for controlling it in any place, whether you're talking about Facebook, where you're talking about a public venue where they're allowing a speaker to come speak, there's no good way to do it that does not step on some people's toes. If you've made videos on TikTok and seen the way they've got a bot that just scans for certain (laughs) words and certain verbiage, I did a video about five days ago explaining how the Electoral College works. Mm -hmm. Basically trying to explain to people outside the United States why this upcoming election is going to come down to like 5,000 people in Pennsylvania because of this very weird way we set it up. TikTok blocked the video. To this day, I do not know what triggered it, but there was something when they scanned through and heard me say the word vote, 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 ballot, vote, polls, mm, ballot. Mm. They decided it was must have been a video about misinformation or something, so they just held the video because their system is wow. uh, censor first, ask questions later. Like It's always yeah. safer to censor. Right. That impulse to try to put a lid on the bad things people are saying Totally sensible because you can give me examples from history where, you know, you had rumors and misinformation that spread through a population and then you had a genocide that occurred there. This is Facebook can tell you about their own role in certain genocides yeah. around the world where there are certain countries where Facebook was the Internet, like that was the only platform. And so it was just extremely easy to spread some horrific rumor about what this group is doing or whatever. Trying to stop that is the problem for the future because the moment you make the effort to stop it, you fan the flames because we humans, no matter where we live, no matter where we're from, do not like being told what to do. And we do not like being told you're not allowed to say that. So I get 100% the progressive young girl on a college campus and finds out that they've got a guy who's going to come speak on campus and that he is, it's uh, like the bell curve guys. He's going to do a speech about how, look, there's a clear IQ differences between the races. And I'm not in favor of eugenics, but let's be honest. <laughs> and so they hear that and say, no, no. Yeah. You, you, you give him that venue. You let people buy tickets to come listen to him speak. To some degree, you are endorsing that this is a thing that needs to be heard. No, I, I'm going to treat this. I'm I'm going to treat this same way if I was in Germany in 1930, whatever, and I heard Hitler come to my bar to try to rile up everybody. I'm going to come there. I'm going to shout him down. Like, I, forget about all of your. This is not the time for debate. This is not time for whatever. So I get wanting to say no. We're going to block the door and we're going to shout, "This guy's a Nazi." Like he's he has dressed up race science in very academic sounding terms. We're not going to allow this. Not in our house. I get it. I believe the actual mechanism is that once you do that, you give that person yep. credibility yep. because his whole shtick is this is this forbidden truth that they don't want you to hear. And I think especially among Americans in our culture, that I when we're looking for something to listen to, the one way to promise that this is interesting is if you tell me it's forbidden. It's too hot for TV or whatever. So if you, you know, if if you show me a content warning on a video, my God, I click on that as fast as possible. It's like, man, this must be hot as hell. Because if you've said, hey, we've judged this information to be too dangerous for you. You can't handle it. Well, you've just told me that it's interesting. You've told me that it's novel. 
that it because if you tell me like you know it's same thing in the 90s when they started putting those parental we'll advisory it. stickers on <laughs> rap albums i would not buy a hip-hop album without that sticker. unless it has. it's gonna it's gonna be lame it's gonna be a lame pop do you show me that sticker i get i because i we we only had a walmart where we could buy music walmart would not carry stuff for that i had to yeah. stop buying music at walmart i'd go find a record score ne- next town over it's actually got the real stuff so my view is that you are helping those people. Like there are guys out there who have made their reputations off mm-hmm. those protests yep. because see, see all these, these, these liberals who, who want to silence me, that they're afraid of what I have to say. And it's like, well, they're afraid of what you have to say. Cause what you're saying is a series of lies and you're saying it in a venue where nobody's going to push back. You, yep. You're going to be able to claim that you've got backing for everything you say. And I do not have a good, answer for that. I, I understand in this media environment why people become sincerious. I, I understand why they want to become censors and why they want to silence and deplatform. I get it. I do. Even though I'm somebody that makes my living with speech. Yeah. But I know that there's nothing I can do to promote my book on TikTok or anywhere else that will get as much traction as if I could have someone make a video about how it should be banned that would set the book on fire. Like at that point, all this stuff that I'm doing to promote all of these podcast appearances, just sit back and and collect, collect my money because that's the thing that really, you know, that that really engages people. There's no good answer. I, 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 again, I get why me coming to the college campus and saying, no, let the Nazi speak, let the Nazi speak. We must hear what he has to say. I get why they think that's absurd and yeah. that's not the way, that's not the way you stop certain people. But I think you cannot pretend like in this era with this technology that you actually have the ability to silence these people. Because you don't, their fans will hear what they have to say. It's, you don't control the printing press. You don't control, fine, you shut down that one evening, you you delayed their speech or they had to go back home. It made headlines across right-wing media. Now they're booked on Fox News. Now they're booked on, uh, you know, RT Today. They're booked on on Tucker Carlson because they're now going to make their next year off of them getting Mm -hmm. that one speech canceled. I don't think it works. I think my argument to those people who are saying, no, we've got to deplatform, I would say you can't, you're not doing it. You're not successfully doing it. It's not effective. So if you want your side to win, the only way is to get better at pushing your side of the argument. The only way, not because it's not based on some ideal of, well, we should all just sit around calmly discussing all ideas, including racism. Who knows? Maybe we were wrong about it. It's not that. Mm -hmm. It's that I think this is the only way. I I think trying to show that you're a reasonable person, that you can articulate, articulate your ideas well, and that your fears are founded. I think that's the only way. And I I get why it doesn't, it feels like you're sitting by and letting horrors unfold by just letting these people speak. But I don't think you can silence Joe Rogan. I don't think you can silence I- any of these people who you would, who you think are spreading whatever anti-vax stuff, any of that stuff. I don't think there's a method to actually deplatform. So I think everything you're doing on that end is misguided, but they're 19 year old college kids. Of course it's yeah. misguided. Yeah. They also, the ones trying to shout everybody down are also, they're just kids. I, yeah. I was a kid when I was 28. And it's one of those things where, again, yeah, that no one's thinking that. No one's understanding that these are not fully developed humans engaging in these conversations. Well, um, I'll, I'll try to get you out of here. Uh, well, first of all, I'll do you a favor. Uh, don't don't get Jason's book because it, it's, it should be, it's forbidden. <laughs> It's, it's this, the information in this book is is, is is too much. You shouldn't, it's it's forbidden. It's going to be banned. And no, I'm just kidding. Uh, but no, uh, in all seriousness, I, I really did enjoy this read. It, 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 it was one of those things that made me take a look and reflect on my own role in social media. Even though I don't feel like I have a particularly toxic role in social media, I, I can see how some things that I do for my history videos and my skits, I can see how some of that can get taken out of context. And I have had people take one of my videos and like stitch it and do something really weird with it and take something from it and misinterpret it entirely. And I'm like, wait a minute, that's, that's not 
what I was trying to say at all. But, but because my videos are very just rooted in the facts and I don't push a lot of opinions in them, it's very easy to take them and kind of twist them in these weird narratives. You and I are both trying to, we're both using the same ethos, which is we're going to try to be the good ones. We're going to try to, we're going to try to try. use this for good and be a place where somebody can come here and learn something and it's not hateful and it's not trying to attack anybody. It's trying to let, let people learn and be, feel, come away and feel like the six straight hours they spent scrolling TikTok was not entirely wasted. Like, oh, actually, I did learn something. If, if somebody yeah. asked me, well, what, what did you benefit from watching those 275 <laughs> videos you just watched, none of which you retained? It's like, that's not true. I remember this fact. This guy did the sketch about how uh, about how prohibition was ended, and it was fascinating. I learned a totally different – It's the, the narrative was totally different from what I, I thought – so we're both trying to be, and I get it that in theory, all of our viewers would be better off if they went outside. But the yeah. idea is that if you can, if you can, and there's a lot of good stuff on there. Look, we're yeah. people come on TikTok and even Twitter, the worst of the worst, except for like what, whatever Donald Trump's custom <laughs> Twitter thing is. I don't remember what it's called. Like there's good stuff on all of them. There's yes. a pe reason people get Absolutely. addicted to it. And, and Twitter used to be, the best place to follow breaking news. Oh yeah. Because once oh, yeah, upon 100%. a time you could actually just get all a feed of all of the actual journalists. Mm -hmm. And as soon as something was confirmed, you would know. Whereas now under Musk's reign, the, it's the people spreading rumors. If they pay like eight bucks a month, their thing gets boosted in the feed. But there's a reason we're all on there. There's a reason why, you know, Joe Biden announced he was dropping out on Twitter. On Twitter. Like that's where the announcement occurred was on Twitter there's a reason we're on there. There's a lot of good stuff. It's just, that's what makes it so dangerous. If it was all trash, well, th then that would be easy. Just tell everybody, delete the apps. Mm -hmm. But there's a reason we're not going to do it. There's a reason I'm on there every day. Y even though I wrote an entire book, like dissecting exactly how toxic it can be and how it can go wrong. I'm still on there. I'm going to get on there as soon as I get off this, this call with you. Um, what is one of, and this will be the last question. What is one of the main takeaways that you want a person to come away with from your new book, I'm starting to worry about this black box of doom. So for a lot of people who are going to read this book are themselves not terminally online. So from them, it's going to be an education into a subculture, yeah. which is I tried to frame it the same way if you read a book about you know some scene, the punk scene in the 70s, something you weren't there for, and it's just mm -hmm. fascinating to see on the inside of it. This is in some ways a look for an outsider to see what this ecosystem looks like, if you're not somebody who's just constantly online and the way the weird, like the way people talk to each other, the way they hide behind identities and like fictional versions of themselves, the way all these weird petty arguments are constantly like people invent things to argue about for them. I think it will be hopefully helping them understand a little bit more about why suddenly politics looks the way it does why suddenly the culture looks the way it does because if you're not there to see the memes get formed and then suddenly you're watching like the super bowl and they're referencing something during the halftime show that is, is that like a meme or something it's like yeah this stuff escaped that was on 4chan five years ago and now it's at the super bowl that's the path like these guys people who are watching the january 6th riots at the capitol and these people wearing t-shirts with a q on it and like what's q what is that who's what what does q stand for is that like then it's like okay so there's a site called 4chan and there's a guy who came on there and blah 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 like they see the stuff just escape into the real world. So for a lot of people, this will just be, here's where that stuff is coming from. If you are reading this and in the character of Abbott or an Ether or any of these people, you see yourself, you will take something different away from it. Yeah. <laughs> and I don't know, there may be people out there who have a very healthy balance between how they spend their time on the internet and they find it very easy to just turn it off and walk away and say, I'm not getting sucked into that. Some people, a minority of readers will read it and say, oh my God, this book is about me. This is book is specifically about me. And I'm not telling you to make changes in your life. If that causes you to see yourself from the outside and realize some things about yourself, that is great. That's the best thing a book can do. But at the end of the day, this is a piece of fiction 
And uh, it's not, I, I realize what we discuss about it, we discuss it, it can make it sound like it's very academic or, or whatever. It's not. It is a it is a ticking clock thriller that uh, so a lot of the reviews you read, you're going to see a split where a lot of people are going to say, I read this at the beach and it passed the time and I had a lot of fun and it was over before it, it, I knew it and I had a terrible sunburn. And then you'll have other people say, I, I read this and I literally burned my phone. I, 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 I called my dad and we talked for six hours and I just, I realized that I had wasted my entire youth, my best years of my, when I was at my healthiest, I wasted them staring at a screen for 12 hours a day. And I just, this has caused me to abandon my life and change my name. And I'm going to move to a different country. You're going to see very different because again, some people will see themselves in this and some people will see it as look at these weirdos who have no who have no personal skills because they've been so warped by algorithms that were designed to do nothing but keep you glued to a screen yeah. and to sell ad revenue. Like the algorithms that, that run these are not designed to make you smarter or happier or more satisfied. And in fact, if they, as somebody, there's a famous TikTok video where somebody talked about like the Doritos theory of the economy, where yeah. normally when a human eats food, you get hungry you eat the food, you're satisfied, now you can move on. The idea of junk food is you never stop eating it because you eat a Dorito, you're not satisfied. It's like, well, that was good. Now to move on with my day. The design of a Dorito is to make you want another Dorito. Yeah. And the same thing with ingesting information. In theory, you should have a question. Who should I vote for? Here's the thing. Well, I care, really care about taxes. Uh, this candidate wants to lower my taxes. That's what I'm going to vote for. Now I've made my decision. Now to move on, I'm going to go out and feed the horses. The algorithms want you to never, ever reach that satisfaction yeah. point. Yeah. They never want you to, it's not a matter of, here's a question, here's your answer. Like there was a time, like that was the ideal that you expand your knowledge. I, today I want to learn about the Ottoman Empire and how it collapsed. I will read, now I know, move on. The algorithms are designed for you to never reach that point of being satisfied. and to never let you release your anxiety that whatever anxiety, whatever fear it caused you to go seeking out, whatever the opinions of other people or the approval of other people in the, you know, in, in the guise of people like us to make sure you never get it. Do you never feel like you have the answer? Do you never feel like you now know what's going on, that there's always another mystery. There's always something else to be worried about that if you there's every something that looks like a concern and you read about it and it comes out it's like yeah i think i think it's overblown i think it'll be fine to make sure you never reach that place because the system there's no conspiracy here they only make money if you're staring at the screen yep. and they're all fighting for your time so if it's not if it's not tiktok then it's threads or instagram or youtube or twitch and they're all trying to like pull at different insecurities or whatever yeah. and so when you watch a streaming a big streaming personality that is you know these are the most famous people in the world now these people are there on twitch for 14 hours a day broadcasting that they can't just be goofy comedians they have to have like some worldview they have to be yeah. alerting you to some conspiracy they have to be you know it's scary what's happening with and people wonder well how did these guys started out streaming like video games eight years ago and now they're like ultra right wing it's like because that's what kept people watching yep. this guy just just play Dark Souls for the 37th time. That wasn't going to be enough. Now he's yep. got to be on there talking about how, hey, it's called the Great Replacement Theory. <laughs> they want to replace white people. And it's like, didn't I watch this guy like five years ago? <laughs> wasn't he just a video game streamer? It's like, what happened? <laughs> they eventually figure out this is what keeps people glued to their screen. This is what makes yep. people want to buy merch. Because now I'm not just wearing the t-shirt of some idiot that played Dark Souls for 12 straight hours. I'm part of a movement and I'm standing up for what men or whatever they've, you know, whatever their, their deal is. Uh, and it's all based around that anxiety and of never feeling like it's okay to just stop watching. Yeah. Yeah. There was a video game uh, streamer who was just known for playing random video games. And then she made a comment about Disney race swapping the character, got into a lot of controversy because of it, lost her Twitch account, and then 
the Daily Wire hired her not too long after that. So, so yeah, it's it's like you said the the the, the controversy, the anger. That's what fuels so much of it. And I will say, reading this book, I kind of when you describe those two different people, the one at the beach and the one who burned the phone, I, I was both. I, I will say this: I, I it was, it's such a thrilling read that I was so into the plot and I was so into the story, like what's going to happen next. I couldn't put it down. So I definitely think that most people, if not all, who are just into thrilling reads, will definitely enjoy the ride that you take on this book. Uh, even the actual specific ride, because I've actually traveled from Alabama my home state to California before. So when you were actually describing that ride back uh, east from, from California, I could even like in my head see some of the, uh, the stops they were making because I've actually done that before. So you did a great job just being vividly describing that. But I also was the second person a little bit too. I, I, I did take a very deep look in the mirror and at social media and at myself. But again, that could be a good thing. That, that could lead to someone making changes or spending less time online or reforming the way they argue or not argue at all online. It would be great if we all did that. Uh, I'm trying myself to, to, to get to, to, to argue less on, on social media. Uh, but Jason, I really want to thank you for, for coming to the show. Uh, this was a great conversation. And for everyone watching uh, his new book, I'm Starting to Worry About This Black Box of Doom, will be out September 24th. It is a great read, a very thrilling read, but it's also a read that will really change or at least somewhat change your perspective on social media and how it's all affecting us on so many levels. Uh, Jason Pargin, thank you so much for joining me. I really appreciate it. Thank you.